All right, so as you can see, we have an extended bell work today. It's the only of its kind for this unit. So you've got four questions up here, all having to do with either the 50 stations or the reading you did in 14.3. So either one of those can help you answer these questions. And so instead of going one at a time through the questions, we're going to do them all as a chunk because we do have to go through them a little faster than we normally would have to. So go ahead and we'll spend about probably seven minutes answering the questions. Just let me know if you have any questions about these because that first one can be tricky. All right, so that's enough time answering the bell work. So let's go to number one. What factors increased the standard of living in the 1950s? What was it? What was going on? What legislation was passed? So what did military personnel get upon their return home? So they got a GI bill. All of them went back to school. Right. They got a GI bill. And they all went back to school because you have to remember people fighting in World War II, the young men. Most of them were high school dropouts. Maybe some of them had their high school diploma. And Barely any of them had any college experience. They had college experience. They were an officer right away. So the GI Bill allowed them to go back, get an education, maybe purchase a house, maybe set up a business, and basically let them have a higher wage to increase to the post-war prosperity. Yeah, that's the major one. There was also other things happening, like the stock market increase, but those are all pretty obscure. So then what goods were they purchasing to help them in this new life? Here we get to the fun part, right? <coughs> goods were they purchasing? Someone else want to go? What did you drive here today to school? Abby? What did you drive? A what? A car. Wow. Yeah, they had those in the 1950s, too. Yeah. They had cars. And that was allowing other things to happen in the economy. We know that's where we get drive-ins, drive throughs <laughs> Car economy was occurring. What else were they buying? What did you see in the ads in our 50s stations? Vacuum cleaner. Yeah, no more sweeping for us. We've got a fancy new vacuum cleaner. The future is here. What else? Washing machines. Washing machines. Yeah, is it, was that the ad? Was that the dishwasher ad? That was the... Well, there, was, there was a dishwasher, but washing machines also. Was that the ad where it was the guy doing dishes and it was targeted towards men who have to help with dishes? Do you remember that advertisement? Do you actually? Okay, just checking. Yeah, there was that ad that was for men that had to help their wives, and basically they were trying to get men to go out and buy the dishwashing machine. And it'd be like, why, why should you suffer doing the dishes? Just do the dishes. Gosh, it's not that difficult. All right. Anything else on inventions that helped increase the standard of living? Maybe one that didn't help increase the standard of living, but allow us, allow us to all kind of be on our couches a lot more. Mm -hmm. TV, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I can see it, I can see it. All right, yeah, television. We already kind of talked about it in the quiz. It was a big deal. A lot of people had it to watch the news and other programming. And let's go on to number two. What might have motivated the culture of conformity during the post-war years? What was happening that everyone thought they needed to live exactly the same way? What? I thought I heard something from Hamilton. No? Okay. 
Mackenzie. Segregation. Well, yeah, okay, so segregation would be a form of upholding conformity because it was saying, hey, we need a space for just people like us, just people who have the same values, obviously in a much more aggressive and racist way, but different. Yes, so TV shows and movies were putting out the idea that everyone needed to be in the suburbs. You watched, well, you watched I Love Lucy, which was hilarious. The chicken and the rice. Talk about later. Anyway, but you also watch Father Knows Best, which put forth the idea that you need to be in a suburb house. You need to be married. You need to have two kids. He has three kids in the show, which is weird because the norm was two kids. But those are all things you need to be American. Because if you didn't conform to American society, what were you? Say it, say it with me. Communist. Yes, we learned from our McCarthy trials that anyone who wants to open a day spa and do something different is a communist. So yes, also, we didn't talk about this, but there was also a conformity of the way you needed to marry. A question they would ask you during McCarthy trials that we didn't ask was they would literally sit people down and ask you, are you gay? And that, to them, meant that you could have communist sympathies, which now, in 2019, is crazy to us a little bit. But back then, it made sense to them, because that would have been different or other. Yeah, fun, fun tidbit about the 50s. It was a different time. What were they saying about conformity? It well, wasn't Nike, Nathan, so they didn't say do it. But they said something like that, a little more specific. They said, what were they saying about material goods in order to conform to society? Buy it. You said do it. That's not a specific enough verb. No, buy it. If you want to conform and be an American, you need to go buy things. Use that money you have. Yeah. All right. So why do you think the numbers of poor in the cities was growing during this time? What was happening? The wealth was leaving the cities. All the people with money and jobs were moving to the suburbs and the businesses that wanted their you know, money left with them. Specifically, during this time, we had something called white flight, which I think we talked about in this class a little bit. Yeah. So white families would leave to the suburbs, businesses would follow, leaving the city's minorities and with like a lot less wealth in their cities and they had a lot harder time petitioning for any kind of help from city governments. Then just to get to the last question, how did the beat movement and rock and roll contrast to norms of the 50s? Let's start with the beat movement. We only covered them a little bit in the reading, not that kind of beat. I saw Mackenzie dancing, so I was like, Anyway, but the beat movement, if you remember, was a bunch of, well, it was short for beatniks, but a bunch of authors, poets, writers, mainly based in San Francisco, who put out a lot of writing about 1950s culture. What were they saying about 1950s culture? What, Luna? It's bad? Yeah, it is bad. They were saying that it was dumb to be a conformist, and you shouldn't do it. What? No, they weren't saying be communist, necessarily. Um, so basically, people like Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, they were putting out the idea that 
we had sacrificed our souls in order to have these material goods and have higher paying jobs. Literally, that's what Allen Ginsberg says in his most famous poem, How. He talks about how Western society has become an altar to the biblical and Hebrew god Moloch, who is the god of sacrifice. Now, cheery guy. Very cheerful. And then what about rock and roll? How were they contradicting 1950s conformity? What did you see in those rock songs? What was the what was it like the vibe of those songs? What? They were edgy. They were moving their hips. This was a footloose society and they were dancing. Has everyone seen Footloose? Please please say yes. Okay, good. No? Okay. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, no, it was very counterculture to go on a nationally televised program like Ed Sullivan and then dance like that, like Elvis was, like the people clapping their his, their hands behind him was. I think that'd be the easiest job ever in that video. The people were like just keeping up beat with their hands. That's my kind of instrument. All right, so any questions on the bell before we move on? All right. So what I'd like you to do is you're going to go to page 115 and you're going to title it Election of 1960. All right. So we're leaving the 1950s today. And I know it seems like we just got here. But really the last four lessons we've done have been on the 1950s. Because we did our McCarthyism unit. We did our Korean War stuff. We did what was the other one? We did the BBQ, which technically on the 1950s, and we did our 1950s station. Oh, I thought there was someone in the back of the class. There was just someone walking by really loudly. Huh. Okay. So anyway, we come to the end of the 50s. And we have the understand the 50s is it was predominantly presided over by only one person. And that was Dwight D. Eisenhower, World War II general won the 1952 election, and then won the 1956 election as well. So pretty much the entire decade was the Eisenhower decade. And yet, not yesterday, but the day before that, someone mentioned to me that the 1950s seems like it was a loading screen between the 1940s, where we had World War II, so big events were happening, and the 1960s, where we would get big events happening with civil rights in Vietnam. The 1950s kind of feels like this transition time, and that's pretty accurate because Eisenhower was okay with everything. He just kept New Deal policies going from FDR and kind of didn't do anything big in government. But then we get to 1960, and we get a pretty major election in 1960 between Richard Nixon, a Californian senator, very anti-communist, Republican. He actually kind of helped with the HUAC stuff. And this man, John F. Kennedy, a Democrat and extremely young in comparison to past presidents. He was only 43. And in recent memory, we'd had FDR, who died in office, Truman, who was old, and Eisenhower, who was older as well. He was the first major candidate born in the 1900s. Every other president before him had been born in the 1800s. And that was a lot of his marketing. He was saying, hey, why would we want someone who's constantly trying to restore some kind of 1800s greatness when we can look to the future? And so he was playing on people's optimism in the post-war years. Also, again, young, energetic. He was putting forth a large progressive policy that the government could enact to tackle every issue in the United States, almost. And also there was this thing called the Kennedy mystique, which is 
John Kennedy himself, but also his wife. 